Aloha kako. My name is Taylor Chang. I'm honored to welcome everybody to this virtual space from my home in Kaimuki on Oahu. I serve as curator of film and performance at the Honolulu Museum of Art, Doris Duke Theater. We're located in Honolulu, Hawaii. Hawaii, of course, being the land of Kanaka Oibi. In addition to acknowledging the land, we also want to acknowledge the many film and media makers who came before us, who have all shaped the contemporary Hawaiian filmmakers of today. Today's program creates space for, um, for us to acknowledge um, those who we have you know, stood on the shoulders of from the early pioneers like Namako Ka'aina, Victoria Keith, Eddie Kamai, Mera Tamita, and many, many more. Uh, we're creating space for Kanaka Maoli Native Hawaiian filmmakers who have carried on the work of their predecessors to take stock of what Native Hawaiian filmmaking looks like today and vision what Native Hawaiian filmmaking will look like going forward. By looking back uh, and looking at how we've evolved to this point and looking ahead, um, visioning what's possible for the future, we hope to present a glimpse of, of what a thriving genealogy of Hawaii filmmaking looks like. Thanks, Taylor. Um, hi, my name is Yana Tala'i, joining you from my hometown of Wailua, Hawaii, and I'm the senior manager of the Sundance Institute Indigenous Program. We wanted to present to you a panel inspired by intimate Palhana conversations by Hawaiian filmmakers for Hawaiian filmmakers, and we invite you to join in and listen to these candid and insightful conversations. In this space, you'll meet a range of filmmakers at different journeys in their career, all currently working on a diverse array of projects. They're all connected through a beautiful and interconnected web of friendship, community, and film. Enjoy the conversations. Aloha pumehana kako, mai kupuka ana ke anau kala. My name is Kiara Lacey and I am a Kanaka Maoli filmmaker, but I have the pleasure of introducing of somebody who is very near and dear to my heart, filmmaker Tai Sanga. I like to reference him as famous Tai Sanga. He is uh, an Emmy award-winning filmmaker uh, with his series, Family Ingredients. Also the first native Hawaiian male to have presented a film directed uh, by him at the Sundance Film Festival called Stones. Um, he is an incredible talent, both on the page as a writer and as a director. And it is my absolute privilege to call him my friend. Um, so welcome Tai Sanga to today's panel. Oh man, thank you Kiara. Um, all right, so it's my honor to introduce the next guy who is Chris Kuhunahana. Uh, Kuhunahana is a Kanaka Maoli artist and Sundance Institute feature film and Native Lab alumni. He's a writer, producer, director, editor of Waikiki, which premiered at the Urban Film Festival. Waikiki was recognized as a Grand Jury Award for Best U.S. Narrative Film and a Special Jury Award for Cinematography at the Los Angeles Asian Pacific Film Festival and was also, made, was also awarded Best Made in Hawaii Feature Film and Jury Award at the, uh, for Best Cinematography at the Hawaii International Film Festival. Waikiki has been praised as stunning, powerful, nuanced, surrealistic journey of critical importance, and I cannot agree more. Um, I know in Chris Kuhunahana because he, back in the days he used to own a bar and we used to do uh, 24 hour film, fest uh, film festivals. We try to make movies um, and he was, he created a, a hub for us artists to find our voice and become filmmakers. So, so mahalo, 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 Chris Kuhunahana. Thank you, Ty. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Naleo Anthony. Uh, he is the founder of Haliku documentary films, and his interest is in preserving and recording oral stories from our people by, from our own voices. And he's also been huge and instrumental in creating some of the organizations, which has gotten a lot of uh, Kanaka filmmakers interested in film, like OEB TV, he's worked on documentaries on the Hokulea. And it's always been, he's always been someone I looked up to, and it's a great pleasure to share a panel with him. And that's not Leo Anthony. Hello, everybody, and thank you, Chris. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Kiara Lacey. Uh, Kiara is a Kanaka Maoli filmmaker whose interest lies in crafting films that use strong characters and investigative journalism to challenge the creative and political status quo. Her work has been shown at festivals around the world, including um, Sundance, 
Uh, she's also screened on um, Netflix, PBS, ABC, Al Jazeera. And in the digital space, she's created content for The Guardian and Atlantic Online. She was the inaugural Sundance Institute Minata Mita Fellow. Uh, as an aside, um, Minata has uh, been one of the, the shining lights in, in Hawaii uh, cinema and has been a, a mentor to many of us. So I was really proud that uh, Kiara was the first one to uh, be one of the fellows uh, with her name attached to it at Sundance. Um, she holds a, a BA in psychology from Yale University and has given uh, talks at academic institutions across the US. Um, but most importantly, uh, personally, I think uh, she's done incredible work in and around the space of uh, telling stories that are um, meaningful, not just to Native Hawaiians, but share uh, that voice that people can um, hear and feel and that resonates uh, across, across platforms and certainly uh, the work that she's done with um, uh, the incarcerated populations and out of state has really uh, opened people's eyes to some of the challenges that Native Hawaiians have uh, who are incarcerated, who are taken from our homeland and, and um, placed in other, other states. Uh, so Kiara, I just want to say, you know, thank you for all your work and I'm looking forward to a great discussion today. Aloha. Oh, you're, you're, you're still you're muted. <laughs> Sorry, amateur hour. Um, I forgot to mention I met Tai Sanga in a Starbucks um, in Waipio Gentry. At, uh, so, you know, I think we all kind of know each other in formal and informal ways. Um, and just grateful to be talking story with everybody. And, you know, I, one thing, Tai, I know you, <laughs> but I, I don't know if I ever asked you why you became a filmmaker because you had a whole nother career before you started making movies. Like you were doing a whole different thing. Like what made you, what made you want to become a filmmaker and, and change paths? And we can all talk about what got us on this crazy, crazy journey. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks Kiara. Um, yeah. Um, so I, you know, my, my, my entire family um, work in the hotel industry. Um, I was raised in the hotel industry um, from a small kid time, basically put in the cart as a little baby and pushed around the hotel and, and seen the ins and outs of it. So I, I saw that when I was growing up, like that was going to be what I thought I, I, my future in Hawaii. Um, I like showcasing our, what we have here in Hawaii with and sharing that with other people. Um, and so I, almost for five years, I worked in the hotel industry um, and it just ate me up. I, like, I just couldn't do it for any longer. It just wasn't for me specifically. If I knew I was gonna commit my time to something 24 seven, um, I had to be something a little bit more, uh, uh, more meaningful to me. Um, so I went back to UH. Um, first class I took uh, back at the university was an ethnic studies course um, with, uh, Daviana McGregor, and she screened a Sand Island story um, in class. You know, the lights are all turned off. There was like 30 of us in the, the class. It's intro class. So I'm just sitting there watching this film, getting emotional, getting like teary eyed, getting angry. And then, you know, the lights turned back on and, and it was in the class and everyone left. And I was still kind of shocked at what I just witnessed. Um, what did you witness? Because the pe for the people out oh. there, don't Thank know you. our worldview and our experiences, Kanaka. Like, yeah, tell them what because Santa and stories has the same impact on me. Um, right, and I, I and I've used that material too. In I, don't, I think I think we've all used that material <laughs> actually. It's, um, seminal work for our community. Um, right. yeah, what, what is it? Um, so it's the evictions of, of Native Hawaiians um, in this small area called Sand Island. Um, and, you know, it's very riveting footage of, you know, policemen, even Native Hawaiian policemen documenting these Native Hawaiians that are there or, you know, people that are living on this, this land, parcel land, um, making, moving, ma moving it for development. Um, and, you know, they're like burning down these homes and these men are holding, you know, the men are, are holding signs that, you know, to, to show that, you know, they're being arrested. Um, and it was, it was difficult for me to watch um, at the same time too it's like I knew every single person on screen like I felt connected to every single one of them and I feel like I've been trying to uh, you know capture that in all of my films since that 
point, like I wanted to be, you know, film is a transformative medium um, and we all know that. Um, and I've been trying to achieve that ever since that point. Um, so I'm actually grateful for my ethics studies class, <laughs> having us sit down and watch movies. Cause you know, sometimes when you go in, you think, you know, you, most as a student, you're just gonna shut off sometimes when you watch a movie. Um, but for me, it wasn't the case there and it, it definitely influenced me on this path to be a storyteller. So, yeah. Chris, how did you become a filmmaker? Because you had a different career. Like you were like, you had a bar, you were pivotal in trailblazing the nightlife in, in Hawaii, in downtown. You revitalized that community. Um, and then, and you always knew you was an artist though. I, I knew you had that art, artistic flair. Um, what what no. made you take the shift? Yeah, I, yeah, like you said, I kind of always knew uh, I was going to do something in the arts, you know, since whatever small kid time, I always was a guy who won awards for drawing pictures or copying Star, Star Wars characters or whatever. So it's always, it's always been something. I didn't, you know, know it was film until I got into photography initially in high school. And I was watching the, you know, you know, processing film and seeing it come to life in a, in a, a chemical and physical proce uh, process. And that capturing the light really, in, you know, it was intriguing to me. So it, we went from that to started shooting um, time lapse uh, with 16 millimeter, eight millimeter. And so I kind of got into film through it as a visual art form, more so than a storytelling uh, medium. And I think I only got really understood the power of story after, you know, after college. And, you know, initially when you start getting into film, you start watching everyone's movies and it's, it's exciting and thrilling. But um, I think the one movie that really moved me in a way that I didn't understand how to process it was Baraka. I watched it in a, a Cinerama actually. And that thing was so powerful that I, I didn't even know what to think about it. And I think from that moment, I thought, wow, this is something that I could imagine me wanting to do. And about the same time, I had been attending uh, the Hawaii International Film Festival. My mom's a huge, huge film fan. Um, she used to keep me up all night and I'd sit up with her when I, I woke up at night and watch movies with her. But she, she'd attend HIF every year and it was free uh, then. As long as you were in line, you got to see the movie. So she'd have me uh, come down from the university and stand in line, um, probably aging, uh, dating myself, but I stood in line for my mom uh, to watch films. And I saw amazing, amazing stories. Uh, and I think from there is when I decided, you know what, I was a political science major myself. And I thought, you know what, I don't even give a shit about political science. I don't give a shit about business. I, I just, from there on, I kind of just said, film, I'm gonna figure out how to do it. And it's been a long journey to make a feature film, but it's always been something I, I thought, you know, I could see myself doing. What I find interesting though, Chris, is that your work is still political, right? And, and part of your business savvy has driven your success as a filmmaker, I think, you know? Yeah, yeah, no, that's it. it you know, everything is the personal is political you know as you you know you grow and learn more about the world you realize that everything affects who you are and your self-identity and i think it's uh that's why it's important for us as wine filmmakers to present who we are to the world instead of letting the world define who we are you know and that's why people like Naleo and what he's doing you know it's like representing his his you know he's always been involved in his community but now he you know he decided his goal as a filmmaker was to take those voices and to present them. And, you know, that's how th that particular act inspires other people to, you know, redefine themselves and say, hey, you know, we are this, we're not, we're not necessarily a reaction to that. So, you know, Naleo, what, what got you initially involved? And I know you've been doing film and TV for a while. You know, um, both my parents are, are you know political activists right and my father's from Fiji and my mother is Hawaiian and from Hawaii and so I grew up on the picket line you know I five years old was stop 7-eleven you know seven years old was the, the brown eviction and and by um by like 12 years old we were protesting outside the capitol uh for the right to sue it was like that you know that the the state had 
at that time made so many poor decisions on behalf of Native Hawaiians um, with the resources that they did have. That that but Hawaiians couldn't sue the government as a you know as an entity, and so we're out there. And I remember very clearly that you know we're holding signs, and it's like uh, every time somebody honks, it's like you feel like this exhilaration, like oh they're with us, you know. But I remember thinking like you know, there's, there's got to be a better way to interface with people rather than holding a song, a sign that says honk for Hawaiians, you know, because what did you, yeah, what did you learn, you know, in that process? And, and then years later, um, you know, very similar to what, what um, Ty described, I was in a Hawaiian studies class and we watched um, the Wamanalo evictions and that just shook me to the core. And very, very similar experience to what, what Ty was talking about. And um, that was, I think, maybe one of the first times that I realized the power of something that could be captured and then replayed. And then people would have uh, similar emotions in a, in, a, in a large audience. And several years later, when I found my way into filmmaking, I had the opportunity to, it was, a, it was an early um, hokulea piece that I was cutting. Like it was one of the first things that I was cutting and it, it was the ability to, um, you know, just evoke emotion through a sequence from other people, from viewers. And, and that was what like signed, signed me up to do filmmaking. It was like, okay, like I want to be able to change the way people feel and the way they think about something. And if I can do that through film, then um, that seems to be something that might grow to a size that can shift not just one or two people at a time, or you know the people who are driving by on Baratania Street, but lots and lots of people, and so that kind of put me on that journey. Um, you know, very quickly realizing that one film at a time wasn't going to do it, and that there had to be a larger platform for us to take part in if we were going to get to critical mass to kind of you know where we're heading towards today in this idea of um, you know feature films, in this idea of collaborating with. Uh, folks from around, Native people from around the world, really, uh, to make sure that our voices are heard and that our perspectives are known. Kia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Where you came from? What school you went? I went, I, I went to Papa Elementary School in Minilani, Oahu, wow. which, is the, which is the equivalent of like an all-American suburb, uh, but in Hawaii. Um, there are two there's a Starbucks, there's like a couple Starbucks and a Walmart. That's what I grew up in. It used to be pineapple fields and um, filmmaking, man. I think when I was little, so like when I was, when I was little, I always liked to, to write stories. Um, I'm very proud of myself to say that I taught myself to type when I was little. So I used to sit on a type, did talk about dating yourself. My dad got a typewriter from a garage sale and um taught me to, I, I, I got it and I taught myself to type and I would type these like crazy weird stories. And I think that's always been part of myself. When I was little, I was like, oh, I'm either gonna be a scientist or like a writer. And um, I didn't really become either. I went to college and I was, I, I, everybody knows I have a music video obsession. I'm gonna throw it out there. If anyone wants to hire me to do a music video, I'm your, I'm your friend. Um, I've always wanted to do one. I absolutely love them. I think they're a beautiful art form. And when I was in college, that's all I did. I like would just watch music videos, but I didn't think it was a career. Um, my mother is a Hawaiian advocate. She's a native Hawaiian who, you know, as growing up would always take me and my sister and our whole family out to, um, we called it activism then, you know, we were activists and people would say that you know, depending on who used that term, it was either they said it with a little bit of spit in their mouth or they said it with pride. And I think for me, it was a source of pride, but I would, you know, I was aware of the difference with how people re receive those words. And um, that was sort of ingrained in me. And I think when I finally gave myself permission to become a storyteller, you know, as a filmmaker um, and not just, you know, work as a producer, which is kind of where I began, you know, um, I think when I finally gave myself that permission, the intersection of, of those two things really inf informed me, like the hope to like create things that are beautiful and meaningful and, you know, have a story to it, but also things that, you know, spoke to my now, spoke to my gut, 
spoke to who I was as a Hawaiian and, you know, the people who raised me and I kind of carry that with me still. Um, I don't want to sound like the angry Hawaiian, but, you know, I got to be honest, sometimes I'm the angry Hawaiian. And I think it's hard not to be angry sometimes. And it's uh, that little balance, you know, it's not, it was funny because I was having a conversation with somebody the other day and they were like, oh, you know, there is like a little bit of anger in your work. And I was like, if you meet me, I don't think you'd think I'm an angry person. Um, but I think part of what fuels me is maybe it's not anger, but like the the um, the search for justice. And I think that is a, a burden and a bearing that we as Kanaka Mawili, as Hawaiians, as like Native peoples, you know, it sits on you, right? And it sort of informs the choices that you make. So. Yeah. It, it also, it, it's also the, the some of the fuel, right? Because as we um, go through these journeys of learning our history in the, in the different ways in which we, we, we stumble upon these things, the, uh, for me anyway, uh, the, first, the first feeling was anger. And it was uh, at the injustice of you know, how we ended up here. And I think you know, part of the, um, the role that we have to play as creatives and as, as filmmakers is to not only work through that because we have seen these places where there are tons and tons of people who are like stuck in the anger part. And then the, the, the fuel for me after the anger part is like, well, what are we gonna do about it? And how do we make sure that we have access to the tools to shift even just the narrative of what, um, what gets said and, and, and who has the voice of authority to say it? You know, that's the, the part that I've stumbled on in, in, this, in this journey is like, the voice of authority was was taken from us for like a couple three generations you know and we're the um this cohort of filmmakers is like the tip of the spear taking it back unapologetically whether it's in feature or in documentary or in, in tv work and news work that's super important to me that the um, the voice is authentic and it's being told by people who uh, are from this place you know uh, I, I think oh, so go ahead go ahead no, it's like exactly. I think that's when, you know, as an artist, when you start learning more about your, your culture and that informs your, uh, how you see the world, right? It informs on the things that affect you as a, as a person. And I think uh, film for all of us has been a way for us to process some of that trauma. You know, it's like, we didn't have that outlet. Like art has always been a way for, people to understand or to grow or to figure out the things that bother them. And I feel the same way. It's like, we are angry, you know, and it, if we didn't have like the opportunity uh, and the privilege to, to use the medium of film, I think, I mean, for myself growing up in Wamanalo, you know, if I didn't have film, I definitely know it would probably not be in a good place. You know, it's like, uh, if I hadn't been inspired uh, at a young age to be able to understand that the process of me thinking about art or making art was the way I could figure out who I am and where I fit in the world. If I didn't have that opportunity, I mean, we see what happens to our communities. You know, it's like if you, if you light a fire and there's nowhere to go, it just consumes you, right? So it's like, uh, I know, I agree that that anger and that chip on our shoulder is like kind of gives us the feel to, to dare to, to tell our own stories. Like you say, an ambassador audacity say, this is who we are. This is, had been wrong for so long. Um, and I do feel that we are, you know, reclaiming our narratives. And I think that's what's most important about this group and uh, this this conversation for sure. When I, and our work. Yeah, and just to add to that, it's like, you know, growing up, I didn't have words for how I felt. Like, I didn't know what, what that was, right? Like now we have a language for it, or at least like, in the context of the world around us, there are words like we can use words like trauma and people will listen to us, right? Whereas before it was like the the words didn't exist because the I feel like the world wasn't ready or wasn't in a place to listen. And I think we're in a really unique moment. Um, so, it, you know, this, it all kind of like strikes me like, okay, now I have words to actually understand how I feel. And that kind of helps me to organize it a little bit. But, um, you know, a lot of this, to me also is just talking about how we as indigenous people like operate within the Western context, you know, within the Western narrative and how we like, how do we interact with that? Like Ty, for your work, like, 
you know, your latest film, Hai Hawaii, right? It's like, how, why did you choose that? And, and like, how do you feel like that interacts with or against um, or taps into and exploits Western storytelling for your own agenda? I don't know. Um, but how do you, yeah, I'm curious. How did you, how did you navigate that? Yeah, I mean, I actually kind of try to wrestle with all of that, to be honest. Um, kind of going back to what Lehu was saying and, and, and Kisku and Han, what all of us have been saying is that, you know, film for me is a healing process. Um, it was about me feeling, I mean, going through these emotions, going through um, learning our history. I mean, you know, us as Native people, we, a lot of our history has been taken away from us. Um, so when we're, we're faced to see it on screen through this medium, it starts this process of, of looking deep within ourselves again. Um, funny, you know, so Hai Hawaii is, is, is a fictional narrative short film about this young boy who uh, steals the flag on annexation, our fake annexation day um, of, uh, to America, um, which tomorrow is the overthrow. Um, but, um, so, you know, we, it's, it's very Native Hawaiian. It's about our, our, our stories, um, but it has a, a fictional part of it. Um, I screened it, you know, Chris knows this story. I screened it uh, around the States and uh, internationally. And then one of the feedbacks I got was that it's not Hawaiian enough. And it, it kind of bothered me a lot because it's like, man, because it doesn't fit into that narrative of either, you know, Iwakuhiko, like very traditional Native Hawaiian, or today what is what, what most people see as indigenous films, which is like either a lower social class sometimes. Um, this story about a monarchy, about kings of Hawaii, about this, 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 this community that existed um, that was on par with any other global nation um, is not Hawaiian to them. And it bothered me a lot actually when I screened it. Um, but that's, you know, that's what our job is to do. You know, our job is to not only here in Hawaii, the rest of the world is trying to learn about our stories. Um, and I'm, for me, I, I kind of float within a different, um, as a storyteller, I like to challenge myself. I think I started out like everyone else, very angry. Um, so a lot of my first films was about this anger, dealing with this anger, healing, healing myself, healing our community. Um, now I think I'm, I'm just kind of shifting over to with, and, and trying to manipulate the, the narrative, using genres to tell these stories um, in a different way. So uh, this film was a heist film. Um, so in some ways, I think that also convinced people that it wasn't a traditional narrative of an indigenous community in Hawaii. Um, so I don't know, I was just trying to push further um, I always kind of go back to what Taiko says. Sometimes it's like, if I tell a story about vampires, does it, is it considered a Maori film, you know? Um, and I think like this too, like it, it's coming from this whole Hawaiian lens. Um, it is a Hawaiian film, you know? Um, I think sometimes in Thor, there's some Maori stories in there that, you know, he kind of planted throughout that kind of infiltrated the system, you know? So, that, so that's our job as storytellers is like getting our stories out there in any way we can. Um, and if someone watches it, like a kid anywhere, connects to that one piece, then he's done his job. Um, so that's, that's, sorry, that was kind of a long story. No, it's not. And it's super oh, interesting. It's, it's super interesting because as we as creators are, are making things, you know, there's an awareness that the media diet that our audience is, is accustomed to is a media diet that as a whole has been crafted by Western perspective. So it's like, how do we interact with that to, to transform what, what people accept as cinema, right? Or what their expectations are. Like if you are used to a certain style of act structure, a certain style of storytelling where the good guy wins, right? Who is the hero, right? These are all things that I think are, be, are greater conversations that are being addressed, dismantled, re-envisioned, right? Like who is the savior? Do we make savior narratives anymore? You know, like how do we, how do we do all of that? And I find it super interesting, super interesting. I mean, not even, not even in cinema, like it's baked into um, media everywhere we go. When I first entered um, news, you know, traditionally news, news was a way in which you could enter into the broadcast world. You know, I, this was before ACM, this was before there were these other avenues to be able to get into broadcasts. And like my second day in news, you know, I realized like I had this epiphany that, you know, the only, um, many of the only times that you see 
uh, a Hawaiian name is when they did something wrong. You know, they killed somebody. Uh, they um, they 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 get arrested. They're getting arraigned. They're going to prison. You know, and that whole reflection of what comes from that just reaffirms what we're taught to think about ourselves. And that's like one of the primary things that we did when we started um, Amy's show, Ola. I mean, never mind the fact that the thing was in Hawaii and it was, and it was on CBS. It was that we consciously chose to tell stories that were a positive reflection in our community. And it didn't mean that they weren't contentious. It didn't mean that they didn't have, um, you know, important things to say. It, it meant that even in the choice of what stories get told is this huge shift if we're choosing from a Hawaiian perspective. If we're talking about, what about all those PhDs that just graduated at UH that um, are gonna go out and be doctors and lawyers and, and, the, oh, and by the way, they're native Hawaiian, right? And that, that shifts the way in which maybe um, not only ourselves can feel about it, but also the people around us, right? And I, I think like the, the cinema half of it, it just, it just takes it to a whole nother level and it reverberates much, much, much farther than what we were able to do just now. I, I want to take a moment for the people who aren't, who, who don't know enough about you and should to recognize the fact that you have been a trailblazer for our community. Right, that you, you know, for people that don't know like enough about Naale, whose work, he has not only, you know, done a lot for Native Hawaiians in terms of collecting news and shifting the perspective of news, but also creating a Hawaiian outlet for for news, you know, in our language, not in our language, and hybridization, but also, you know, just creating a space where we can go to to hear our stories and news about our community from a Hawaiian perspective. And um, do you think what, you, what you're mentioning, like that moment on day two is part of what, part of what drew you to have, you know, to, to do what you've done with, you know, for part of your career? Uh, absolutely, I, I knew that the, I figured out that just, like I thought like top of the, the pile was like being a cameraman, being a DP, choosing what images to shoot. Like the, the editorial in, in picking up a camera and pointing it in one direction is huge editorial. But then I realized like the assignment manager in news had much more power than I did because they were going to say where I went to go shoot. And they made the decision as to, you know, where I would, I would plop down every day and, and record material. And then the, the writer and reporter would choose how they uh, acknowledged all of that in, in the writing and the reporting. And I recognized that you know, in order to do what we needed to do and, and take back the narrative, we needed our own platform. Um, you know, how to get there. I mean, you know, we would be, I mean, the fact that, the fact that, you know, two of those films are mentioned in, in just like what shocked us into becoming filmmakers without uh, Joan and Puhi Pao and Namako Kaaina doing it when it was way more expensive, when they didn't have the technology, when they didn't have the money, but they did it anyway because they saw the importance of it was really the, the spark that lead us here today, you know, because they saw these injustices happening and they knew that it had to be part of the record. And I think pivoting to like how important the record is, like, I, I, and I, I know that you folks, uh, you guys shoot all kind of different material, whether it's documentary, whether it's feature work, but all of that, not only what made it to screen, but the content that you had to capture to get that is the part of the record that is, is not unlike the millions of pages of text that the Bishop Museum in Hawaiian language newspapers where Native Hawaiians wrote all that they could to save what they saw as important as part of the record or the oral traditions that persisted before that. All we're doing now is we're just using different technology to harness that record to make sure that others, you know, 30, 50, 100 years from now understand what was happening in this time and how it shifted the trajectory of where Hawaii is going. Um, this kind of makes me think, you know, we've been talking about what are the stories, what are the, what are the stories and, and how we tell them. And um, I also think process is super important, you know, like how we do. And I know a lot of, a lot of, I know all you guys could say the same thing, right? But, um, you know, how do we, how do we knowing that 
when I learned about film filmmaking and the process involved, like it was, it, it is a structure, you know, very like hierarchical sort of like more military structure where, you know, everyone has their box and their roles on set and there is a set protocol. Um, how have you, and just how you work with others, right? Um, what's that process? Like, I think the traditional American perspective might be the director, you know, is at the top um, and kind of holds um, and sort of ho holds dominion over everything. And it's like, how, how different is how you do as a Kanaka Maoli, as a native Hawaiian, you know, in terms of like process with your filmmaking um, or your collaboration with other people? I think process is like, it starts off there. It's like the way we as native people tell stories, it's not always in a linear fashion. It's not always an ABC structure. So it's like from the very beginning, it's like as you know, we can see stories from different perspectives, like like Makovalu, right? It's like eight different perspectives. We learn to look at things differently. And sometimes it's not always like linear time. I mean, we can look at ancestral time or we can look at place as a character or time as a character or, you know, and the way we understand those concepts, I think influence, or as, as I mean, for me anyway, as I learn more about, you know, intuition or speaking from your, what's inside of you, your na'al, right? Or those things influence on the stories we, that uh, are inspired to tell or feel the kuleana to tell. And I think those things influence not only the process of writing, but, but the way we interact with our communities and also on set, you know, it's like we all start off from that place where it's always been about a community, right? It's like we, we don't, I'm sure if anybody came on any of our sets, it's not like, you know, do it this way, do it this way. It's a lot more organic. And I think it's a lot more uh, connecting between the people uh, working towards this, like a connection to story. And from that connection to story, I think we just approach our work with like a sense of uh, togetherness or, you know, it's, it's just a little bit different. I think it's like, um, we don't think of it as story starting at A and ending and C and kind of just feel like a story goes, it's all encompassing. Like for me, even in terms of the making of this particular film, it's, I didn't ever feel like the end product, what was, what was the most important thing? It's like, goes back to what Naleu saying. It's like, all of it's the document, right? And I've learned the whole time, I and mean, I've rediscovered it many times. It's like, the making of the film is what's important. It's like the doing that's through the doing you learn, right? And it's not like you just, you know, it's not like, you know, I want to make this thing. It's kind of like, I'm doing this thing. I'm becoming this thing. I'm enjoying this process. And that's, I think, even if the film never did anything, it's like that in itself was the point, right? The point was you're, you're actively with intent uh, involving yourself in your own life and in your own stories. And I think that was what's a little bit different for us, you know? Sorry guys, mute it again. Um, Ty, what, what do you think? How do you like- What school I've, you at? What school you, <laughs> Ty. <laughs> Um, I, I've, I've, I've had the opportunity to kind of like creep on some of your sets and just kind of like peek in and, um, you know, see, see sort of your process. Do you feel like, you know, your work has a different sort of community factor? Um, do you feel like the way that, you know, when you're making films in your home with people from your home, do you think it's different than if you were in a different, in a different place? You know, is there sort of like a community vibe to how you operate? Yeah, you know, um, so I, I followed the same thing that you did too, yeah, Kiara, and in, especially I think, I think even Lehu. Um, yeah, I went to film school actually for my graduate program. I didn't go to film school. But you were trained in LA, in the mainland, uh, in New York. I never took a film class. <laughs> I, took, I took film 101 in college. Oh yeah, that's right, that's right. Um, but you, were you folks were trained in the industry. Um, so at, at Chapman University, you know, we, they trained us exactly like, okay, we're going to transition into LA. This is what you're going to learn. The, the regiment, the hierarchies. Um, so when I went back home to Hawaii and I, the first projects I did was all documentaries for Kamehameha schools, you know, and that's, that's a different process. What like, is Kamehameha schools for people that have no idea what that is? 
I think you should you get you and Le who have a better <laughs> definition <laughs> of what Kamehameha schools is. Because <laughs> I'm a different school. I came from a different school. Um, uh, sh- shortcut Kamehameha school. The Kamehameha schools is schools that is a school that was um, created by Bernice Pohi Bishop, who is a Kanaka Maoli Native Hawaiian princess, and she she basically bequeathed her lands and wealth to create a a, a space to educate um, Native Hawaiian children, uh, Indigenous children, pe- just children that needed help and support. And um, I'm grateful to say I'm a beneficiary of that. So, uh, you know, as a, as a part Hawaiian, I was able to attend school there. How do I do Lahu? Do you think I explained it okay? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, maybe the, the absolutely, but the, the implications of um, the power that Kamehameha Schools possesses as being the, the largest private landowner in the state and having a net worth of, I don't know, 10 or $11 billion, I think um, is, is one of the, the like last bastions of hope of, of kind of leveling the playing field, if you will, um, with respect to education, uh, allowing us to walk out of the, some of the, the really tough times that Native Hawaiians have seen over the last 130 years. Wow, and you guys are all wearing blue too. God, jeez. Um, she coordinated that. She actually emailed me and said, I got to do the blue and white thing, the white wall yeah, with the blue geez, jacket. Bro. I actually yeah. tried with Chris Yogi. I emailed him. He's another filmmaker for people out there. He's another filmmaker from Hawaii who has a film called I Was a Simple Man at Sundance this year. Please, please go out and watch it. He is absolutely brilliant. But I was in a Q&A with him the other day and I, I know we have the same t-shirt. And so I like emailed him and I, I was like, wear your t-shirt too. But he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> um mahalo for all was of that was it Brian's soul t-shirt it was the eight, it was the um 1890 oh, the, the one. shirt yeah from savage public so yeah um so going back to what i was saying uh working for Kamehameha schools um you know that, that was a whole nother uh, learning curve because then i worked you know directly with uncle randy fong over there and auntie jamie fong um, and then so for them, the biggest thing was our relationships with the communities, you know, before we come in to document anything or before we come in to tell our, their stories, um, we, we have this relationship. So set for me, like set protocol completely changed. Um, and I think I transitioned that to when I started doing my short films um, where it is a community, you know, we, we as Native Hawaiians, I'm, for me, I feel like we're truly blessed to be able to, to do this, this medium, this art form. Um, because it's, first of all, it's very expensive uh, to do, to do well. Um, but like when you work on a, a good project that everyone believes in, everyone comes together for the right reasons. Um, and we're happy to be on set, you know. Um, every once in a while, we have to like push to get, make our day, you know, there's all the schedules and everything. We're, but it's not like we're fighting anything. We're doing it together and we understand why we're there. Um, and it's, it's beautiful. It's actually really beautiful to see. Um, I hope I can transition this to where like bigger projects where, where there is money involved and there's a producer raining down on you trying to get everything within budget. But um, as of right now, my transition to making a movie is actually about healing, to be honest. Like that's how set is. Um, when we filmed for Hai Hawaii at the palace, um, I actually invited Aina, I invited all of our filmmaker friends because like to be a part of that process, I thought was important for us, you know. Um, to see us all together as a community and to show like, wow, we can do this. Like we can do a big film um, on this big stage talking about big topics, you know? Um, so yeah, I don't know. It's different, very different. What's interesting to me is like, um, I have had people who I work with tell me, oh, you, you don't do stuff the same way. <laughs> like, what do you mean? You know, I think I've like consciously made the decision to just work how I think I should work. And I've been very, um, I have been very intentional about creating the right spaces for me and how I think I want to be and how I want to work. And um, it's radical for some people, you know, like people are like, oh my God, you know, it's, they're like, I haven't worked on a project that I believed in in so long, you know, and and I'm like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm not saying that sometimes we need a paycheck and sometimes we do need to work and some, and it's not always that, that um that that synchronicity between mission driven and dollar driven right those don't always line up 
But for me, as much as possible, it's like, you know, I move with my heart and trying to work on things that I think speak to me on, on like, on more than just a paycheck level is essential. And I think when you are, have the privilege to make work from that space, you know, other people respond to it. You know, it changes how, how they collaborate with you. And, you know, I want, I also, for me personally, it's like, you know, I don't need to scream on set, you know, and if we're, if I'm working with you as a real collaborator, right. And I, and we're working together, you know, my goal is I'm actually here to listen to you too, right. The healing isn't just for me to tell my story, right. It's collaborative community healing if we're doing the work, right. And I want everyone to feel ownership over the work. It's not just my work, it's their work too. And like, if we're going to get radical about it and we talk about this in my short this year, this is the way we rise. It's like, who owns the work, right. If we're talking about work and this is like, Kanaka Maoli IP. <laughs> so Native Hawaiian intellectual property concepts, right? But if I'm if I'm writing, if I am making a film about somebody, you know, Western perspective, well, it's my film, I'm the director, right? That's who owns it. And maybe in the in the paperwork, the pala pala, the ownership is like, you know, the copyright goes to the production company, et cetera. But like who does it really belong to? It belongs to the person whose face we see on screen. It belongs to the story that we're telling it about. You know, I tell a story about Jamaica Osorio's experience at Mauna Kea and the protection of that. Like, that's not my story. That's her story. This film belongs to her, right? And that's a that's a critical distinction, I think, as a as a filmmaker, you know, as Hawaiians. Like, I write a song about, let's say, Hawaiian, Hawaiian flip on it. Dolly Parton writes a song. I don't know why this is coming up, bad example. Dolly Parton writes a song, Jolene. <laughs> I don't know why I'm thinking about this, but like, who does the song belong to? It belongs to Jolene, because it's about Jolene. So um, I'll have a better example next time, guys, but I don't know, you know, I maybe it's, I think that for me is like a critical divergence in terms of process and like um, outcomes. It's like, my, my, my ego exists in a different space because it's not mine. The work isn't mine. The work belongs to who we see um, and who I'm trying to talk to. Mm -hmm. On that note, getting radical. <laughs> is is um, Jody on your uh, karaoke playlist? Is that you on your hit list? Okay, no, but <laughs> my mom and dad have been going to Jolene's in Chinatown and to eat the... Uh the lobster rolls and it, it's like they stopped by yesterday to drop off mail and then go get the Jolene's lobster roll. So Jolene's has been on my mind. For anyone out there, if you come to Hawaii, you can get your lobster roll and lobster salad at Jolene's in Chinatown <laughs> on Oahu. But don't come. Not yet, everyone stay not safe yet. now, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so we've talked about where we started. We've talked about, you know, what stories we want to tell and kind of how we're telling it. Like, I don't know. We're in a really interesting transitional moment um, for our community. Um, I think like, and for, yeah, we're in a really interesting transitional moment um, in the world even, you know, as we start to see like, vaccinations on the horizon and a shift back into something post COVID, you know, what do we, what's your vision? You know, like, how do you want to see yourself in the next one year, five years, 10 years as like Hawaii filmmaker or like Hawaiian native Hawaiian filmmakers? Do you have like a vision for yourself or for the collective of us? That's a heavy one. I don't know if I have the answer, to be honest. But what you guys thinking about? Like in Lots terms of rope. what's next for you or how? Lots or the rope. <laughs> no, I, you know, um, I think I think it goes back to what Naleo says, is like this is kind of the tip of the spear. It's the beginning of something, you know, it's like I, I do believe as a community we've kind of hit a critical mass. You know, there's enough of us who have dedicated long enough to see some people finally realizing and recognizing uh, the story, our storytellers and our stories. And uh, I mean, not only this little group, this four people, but even the 
um, all the other um, people in the other panel. Is it going to be the same panel or different panel? Same panel? They're going to splice us in there somehow? But uh, yeah, I think in the future, I imagine, I know there's a couple of people who are pushing to get feature films made this next year, COVID uh, allowing that. But uh, I think hopefully we just keep doing what we're doing you know we don't we don't give up and we don't lose that energy and we keep driving forward and sharing our stories and i look forward to us working more together on projects you know it's like i loved walk, working on uh ty's projects and i'd love to work with all of you uh, kiara i know we got projects in the future i'm sure and not little so collaborative i think that's the key to what's going on uh, in the future. I think it's just like us getting more and more things done together. Uh, we push the stone for so, so far, you know, it's like, it's going to be, it's going to be, I'm excited about it. You know, if I could use an example of, um, of something that I think like was really pleasantly surprising to me is like, um, you know, and, and uh, I would encourage everybody who's watching this panel to go watch uh, Kiara's film because it was a great representation of of just a slice in time of what was going on up in the, the movement of the Mauna. Um, but, you know, the, the marker of the, the movement on the, on the Mauna is not just the fact that it would um, inspire people to show up, but on any given day, there were teams of filmmakers who are also inspired to show up. And, you know, um, we, uh, Amy and I, when we were, uh, we shot in, in 15 uh, through all of that, and OEV TV shot through like kind of what had transpired in 2015. And so when it started again, um, we were, we flew to Kona to go and shoot the first meeting and that first, the consecration of Pu'uhulu Hulu, this, this Pu'uhunu, the safe space at the base of the mountain. And then we had to get on a plane because we're shooting a documentary in Spain like the next day. Right. And the concern was like, oh, you know, who's going to cover this? And so there was like this, this discussion of like, well, who's, you know, who's going to do what? And, and I think that was the day I saw uh, Kiara and Chaitan up there getting ready to shoot. I think it was that day. And it was like, okay, what are we going to do? And then, you know, what was clear was like, no, like everybody's coming. And so, you know, what's so important is like, yes, we have all this stuff that we got to do, right? There's like all of this work to pay for the, the extremely high cost of living in Hawaii and the fact that we have to go out every day and figure out how we're going to make our rent and our mortgages and pay for our kids and all that stuff. And then there's the stuff that we want to do, you know, the passion projects, the, and, and, and they slowly overlap over time. Right. But what was so important to me to watch this whole thing unfold was like every day there were just more and more people who were there to make sure that these images could get captured because they were compelled that this is the record. Right back to that that thought about it, and what that also shows is just how much larger and how much more critical mass we have as Hawaiian filmmakers. That that collaborative effort wasn't even about oh you know so and so is working on a project. It's like this is happening. We are compelled to go there. We will go there. We will we will do whatever is necessary to make sure that this story is told. And that is a huge turning point because right before days was just Joan and Puhi Paul, you know doing what they could do. And now we have so many more tools and, and it's just an amazing time to watch all this unfold. Well, and when I hear that, you know, um, for those who aren't familiar with the Mauna, it, Mauna means mountain. And this is a reference to Mauna Kea, which is a incredibly sacred site to our community as Hawaiians. And when we as a community felt like the addition of another telescope would threaten the sanctity of the space, um, there was an incredible outpouring of support from our community to work towards the protection of it to the point where people basically uprooted their lives to move and live there to ensure that you know additional development of this sacred space wouldn't happen. And um, it was an incredibly moving moment for us. And I think one of the things I also took, took away from it was everyone collecting for this bigger goal um, meant that it was about generosity. It was about sharing. It was about kako'ohui, like to collaborate, right? And 
you know, I'd never been in a space where other people are like, yeah, go use my, go use my footage. <laughs> oh, here, take my footage. Chris gave me footage, right? Like I got, Chris, you know, so-and-so gave me footage. Like we were all sharing, you know, it, it was about the record keeping, but also the shared use of that record keeping in a way that was like, for me, like felt radical and felt new because, you know, under a Western system, it's like, if I would like to use your footage, right? There's a process, you know, and obviously we're still engaging in that, like I'll license the footage or we'll get the paperwork done. But it's like, you know, it's not even just that practice. It's just how we feel that people felt like it was okay to, or felt like it was not even just that it was okay, that it was like our duty to share, right? Whereas I think often so much in a capitalist system, like it's more about, it's more, more about aggregating for the individual as opposed to aggregating for the Lahui, for the community, for your people. And I think I walked away from Mauna Kea feeling like this is, this is how I want to be, right? Like, I, I don't want to work in a way where it's just about what I want and the aggregation of my things that I want. I want to work in a space where I feel like I'm contributing and adding to us. And I think as we talk about climate change, as we talk about, you know, the future of this world's survival even, right? That there needs to be a tipping point from just the individual to, to the community, because our survival is, is based on collective collaboration, about us understanding that we don't do well unless the person next to us does well, unless we all make choices that keep each other in mind. Um, yeah. No, that model is powerful for all of us. You know, it's like, I, I agree with what you're saying. It was what, and it goes back to that question, how are we different than other sets? You know, it's like everybody there, it's like a, you have 20 filmmakers and nobody felt the need to take the lead and say, okay, we're going to do it this way. Everyone said, okay, just go out there and do, do what you do. And everybody had ultimate trust that everybody was there for the same story, for the same reason. We were called there for a reason. We weren't just like, like you said, we weren't there for individual gain. It's like uh, a lot of us dedicated huge chunks of our lives and just decided to live there and you know, survive any way we could while we were there, you know, you know, turning away jobs, not working on finishing our projects here in Honolulu. And, and we all felt that there was a bigger need for us and there was a bigger reason for who we were and who, what we were doing. It's like, I felt like I was contributing to something that was like ultimately more important than whatever little thing we're concerned about in our personal daily lives. And that I think is shows what kind of community uh, we are as Hawaiians, right? We're willing to just say, hey, this is important. This is more important than me. And I think that's the beauty of who we are as people in our culture. Ty, you think that's the aloha or what? <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, we, we were all moved by the Mauna for sure. That's like what, what Kunahana was saying. That's what differentiates us from other filmmakers. Um, I, I think, you know, we've all grown from that experience too. Like we, we came into this art form to, to almost grow as, as humans, you know, more so um, and healing our community. Um, but kind of going back to your question, what I'm really excited about for the next 10 to 30 years is the fact that we're, we're shifting as a community. You know, like we talked about like in the beginning, it was about conserving, you know, documenting our history, documenting the narratives. But now I think our communities has gotten to a point where we're comfortable to finally see our stories on screen in a fiction form. Um, and it's, I think that's crucial and very important because we're not a monolithic community. We have different voices. Um, so like Chris Kuhunahana's feature film came out, you know, last year and did amazing. You know, there's so many of us that's already coming out with other feature films. So that switching over from documentaries to fictional narratives is where I think we're going to start shifting, you know, because there is where we'll be able to start in infiltrating the different media sources from that point on. Um, so we are creating IP, like you said earlier, native IP um, that will, you know, entertain the rest of the world, I think, you know, and show how we, sh how the rest of the world should be living, <laughs> you know, in some ways. So, yeah, all exciting times. Sovereignty. It's story, it's, so it's, um... Story sovereignty. Story yeah, sovereignty. Yeah. Chelsea Win Stanley had <laughs> said something incredible. What was the phrase Chelsea's been using? I saw it on Instagram and I can't remember. Uh, I can't remember either. But I think the idea of sovereignty in our storytelling is powerful. You know, it, mm -hmm. it, part of what, part of what um, 
part of how the hegemony dominates our community is by dominating the narrative, the story about who we are. And as the reclamation of that happens, right, as we take that over, they don't control us in the same way. Yep. You know, this, this spin on who we are can be ours as well. Um, and I think that presentation is essential, you know, and I agree with you. It doesn't have to be a singular block. I think there's in intersectionality in every community. You are entitled to say what, what you think and what's true to you, each of us is. It doesn't have to be a singular voice, you know, and I think like, Knowing that, knowing that there is more than one perspective from our community, I think is valuable because that that's the truth. That's the truth. Well, I meant sovereignty as a nation, because uh, you know we were just discussing a little bit earlier. But I think, I mean, in addition to, I think you have to have personal sovereignty before you can have sovereignty as a nation. So I think we're reclaiming our own personal sovereignty with the way we tell our stories. But I think, I mean, I know I want to see a time uh, where as a nation of Hawaii, we get to choose how we utilize our resources. I mean, not only our IP, uh, but our natural resources. And we have power over that. And I think this, these, us putting the stories out there, uh, there was a time when you said sovereignty, people look at you like you straight crazy. You know, you crazy, you crazy. But now it's like, you know, like you said, we were saying earlier, the language changes. You know, there's language to, for people to start understanding who we are, like that, like the word trauma. Now we have an idea of what that means, right? And what, how it affected us. So I'm, I'm pushing for that. <laughs> Personally, that's what I want. I think the backdrop is also changing, right, Chris? Yeah. It's like the, the way in which uh, we're watching national politics and how, um, you know, the rest of the country seems to be tearing itself apart. Uh, over the values that um, that either do or don't persist within uh, the rest of the country. And I think that that shifts the way at which we can address it as well for us in Hawaii. I mean, you know, we were talking about the positive attributes that we have here. You know, the fact that there's 2,500 miles of water between us and everywhere else. And um, that puts Hawaii in a totally different position moving forward. And then moving forward for each of you individually, I, I'm Niele, I want to know, um, what are you working, each working on next? Like what's on the horizon that, you know, that we all need to be tracking um, so we can watch your like upcoming projects, your current projects. Um, what you working on guys? Ty, you go first. <laughs> <laughs> all you guys hiding, shut up. Ty, go. Um. <laughs> I'm I'm developing a, a feature film. We already we already wrote the script, um, but it's a it's about four young men um, that uh, live on these line islands in the Pacific uh, in the 1930s, the late 1930s, um, by themselves in isolation for the United States, um, and they become a, they are attacked um, uh, by Japan uh, during World War II, and they have to find and they have to survive on this island. So that's so the story. This is based on a, on on a history on truth. Yes, yeah, we call it the colonists. It's uh, Heather Juni made a documentary with, with Noel. Um, so it's Hui Pananaau. It's about these young Kamehameha school students that that were forced to not forced. They chose to live on this island as a job. Um, and these boys in my story were unfortunately there when Japan attacks. So yeah, it's one it's one project I'm working on, and the other one obviously is expanding. Hi Hawaii to a TV series. That's the goal for that one. So, yeah. Awesome. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Chris, what you working on? Uh, okay. I know me and no, Leo are next. Pro I know we're both working on uh, a project, just oh, separate yeah. project for the museum. Yeah. I'm working on a 360 installation uh, on the Mauna, actually. But we're shooting it in 360, and it's a fully immersive dome. Uh, besides that, I'm, I've been writing a feature screen screenplay uh thinking about making it actually an episodic because it's just turning out to be too long for one movie um and it's called Iman. it's like a sci-fi set in the near future uh dealing with climate change and uh climate immigrants because of climate change and technology that sounds rad i will be your first viewer that's like totally you have to the screenplay when it's done. <laughs> I want to read it. You know, I love reading your words. I love reading your words. You got good words on the page. Super cool. 
Not only what you do. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, since um, since Taylor Chang is on the call, uh, this Zoom call, I'm um, studiously working on my um, 24, 21 now, I guess, uh, project for the museum. Um, we're trying to, trying to take some of the imagery that came out of the Worldwide Voyage. You know, we ended up with um, more than half a million images and several thousand hours of footage that came out of the Worldwide Voyage. And, uh, you know, there's, a, I think, a number of derivative projects that can be built out of that content for a long time. So we're looking at different ways that we can use that stuff. And then, you know, personally, just kind of trying to use some of the storytelling tools and communication tools to help stamp out COVID in Hawaii. Uh, we have a long way to go. We're in, you know, good shape, but this COVID journey, I think is, before we can get back to all the other stuff, we got to figure it out. So I'm just lending some of my, um, some of the craft for that. Um, the, the, if you guys want to check out my COVID work, I'm seeing this go by in the text. Uh, I hope Netta meant me, uh, covidpal.org. You can go over there. This says some really, really cool stories that have come up and then also just great, uh, great data to track what's going on every day. We just added a widget to it about vaccines and how much vaccine uh, is going out into the community. So hopefully it's helpful. Mahalo. What about you? Sarah, you're just gonna, you're gonna coast on the- uh, Sundance. Miss yeah, Sundance. you're just gonna like uh, Sundance for the rest Sundance. of the year. And then, you know, do the, the upper echelon of the, of the festival circuit for 2021 all virtually. What else are you doing? <laughs> you know what's funny? This, uh, the film that showed at Sundance um, started the festival circuit last March. And I always laugh because I'm a late bloomer. So like, you know, the film comes out and so, to, you know, since we're sort of what would feel like the end of a festival run, I wasn't expecting to have like such an incredible opportunity. I was kind of like, okay, it did what it was and mahalo it for, you know, and it's got out to people. So that's, that's just the goal. So to have Sundance as a platform for a conversation like, you know, the protection of Mauna Kea and, it means a lot. And I think for this year, what's my goal? i tell you my goal. Music video, pretty please, number one. Um, number two, you know, we're talking about bigger dreams and kind of tapping into what Ty had said. Like, I kind of, I've always actually, I never thought I would do documentary. It's just something that kind of happened and I'm grateful to it. But really like I, when I left New York and I came home, I was, I considered myself a writer. I'd just been writing like TV and like scripts and I was, it was still kind of nascent. So I wasn't like, I wouldn't say I was good, but it was what I was doing and what I wanted to do. And I am looking at a boneyard of screenplays and I have like a couple that I would like to actually finish and maybe direct a feature film. So, I mean, we all know what kind of beast and road that means, but I, you know, I think I think part of the goal in the year ahead is to, you know, obviously just make as much more as I can um, and then write, you know? So we'll see, we'll see, fingers crossed. Um, but yeah, I just wanna say thank you to you guys. I just, you know, I know I love all of you guys and I think something that's unique about our community is that there is that, that there actually is a community. You know, I can't, I can't say that Having worked in New York, LA, I had that same sense of like family. And I think that's a very Hawaiian thing, you know, and I feel like if there's anything any of us needs, it's pretty, you know, it's just a text message or a phone call away. And I think that's how I always want to operate with you guys. And, um, you know, I mahalo all of you for the support you've given me and just sharing your mana'o for today, you know? Yeah. Mahalo to all of you for for stepping up and doing all the great work that you guys are doing. It's it's really fun to watch and uh, congratulations on all the accolades, e each of you, you guys all deserve it. You guys have worked so, so hard. And so just really stoked to see where you guys go next. And may the tide rise together. Yes, yes. And mahalo, everyone. mahalo to everybody for watching. Mahalo. Yeah. Mahalo. mahalo to everybody for watching today um, and to Sundance and all the supporters for giving us an opportunity to talk about our vision for the future for our community as Native Hawaiian filmmakers and, um, you know, how we're navigating our storytelling and, you know, please stay tuned. There's going to be more from us all together soon. So mahalo yao ko. Hi, mahalo nui. Aloha. Um, I don't want to speak for everyone, but I think we can all agree that we're really grateful to be here.
there's not a lot of spaces where we get to just have conversations on, you know, what does filmmaking look like for our community? And that is Kanaka led. And so I look very forward to speaking with everybody here. And I will just be present to kind of help guide us along. But yeah, I'm excited for what you can We'll come out of this and to have a good time with my friends and I will kick it off by introducing Justin Achang, a native Hawaiian filmmaker from Mililani, Oahu, but also Kalo Man of Mililani, <laughs> missing from the bio, and also an Imua grad, um, Kamehameha School. So after graduating from USC's School of Cinematic Arts, in 2011, Justin worked as a director, cinematographer, and editor at OEV TV, Hawaii's first indigenous broadcast station. Most recently, his acclaimed film Down on the Sidewalk in Waikiki, which is super awesome, you should watch it, premiered at the 2019 Ma Maori Land Film Festival in New Zealand and shared the People's Choice Award for Best Short Drama. The film has continued to screen at festivals around the world, including the Imaginative Film Festival in Toronto, the Los Angeles Asian Pacific Film Festival, the 307 Film Festival in Wyoming, where it has was awarded for Best of Fest. So basically, Justin is a hammer. And I you should just listen to everything that he shares today from his EK or his EK. See, this is why I'm not a good host. But anyways, back to Justin. Most recently, Justin was involved in producing the George Helm narrative biopic, Hawaiian Soul which premiered at the 2020 Hawaii International Film Festival and won Best Made in Hawaii Short and an Audience Award. He's currently producing Keikama Amona's narrative short, A Malama Pono Willy Boy, and in pre-production for his second directorial narrative short, The Man in the Tree. In addition, Justin continues to create culturally inspired place-based stories on a work for hire basis through his production co company, Olona Media. But yeah, great to have you, Justin. And I'll let you take it for introducing Aina. Mahalo Nui, Aaron. That was an amazing job on the introduction. Thank you so much. Can't forget, can't forget Kalo. Kalo, right? Um, There's a reason I work behind the camera, and as now everybody's finding out why. <laughs> um, yeah, no, Mahalo for that introduction. Um, I guess next I get to introduce one of my best friends, um, both in the film industry and just in real life. Uh, my brother, Aina Paikai, who is um, a talented filmmaker, both behind and in front of the camera. Um, me and Aina both met while working at OEV TV. So he um, sort of got his start in this industry at OEV TV as well. Um, and we've known each other for a little over 10 years now. Think and, and have been making work together for, for over a decade. Um, and uh, yeah, Aina is a Sundance Native Lab Fellow um, where he worked on uh, his narrative short, which became Hawaiian Soul, um, a project that I got to work on with him, narrative biopic about one of our beloved musicians and activists here in Hawaii, George Jarrett Helm Jr. And, um, yeah, we're just starting our film festival run on that. Um, we premiered at the Hawaii International Film Festival this year in 2020, where um, Aina's film was awarded Best Made in Hawaii Short Film and took home an audience award as well, um, doing big things. And then also, uh, just before that, he was the lead actor and screenwriter in my film, Down on the Sidewalk in Waikiki. So a lot of time together, a lot of awesome experiences, uh, getting to work together, and um, yeah, be a part of this amazing community and this amazing movement. Um, forgetting anything? I don't think so. Yeah. Welcome to the space, Aina. Mahalo, brethren, which is the cute name that we have for each other. Me, brethren. Um, yes, best friend, best man at my wedding. And um, yeah, man responsible for putting me in front of the camera for Down on the Sidewalk in Waikiki which is one of my favorite films, to be honest. And i um, very thankful for our, our relationship, as well as um, everyone else, uh, a part of these, um, this hui of uh, panelists today, as well as, uh, yeah. Um, I'm here to introduce 
Mr. Bryson, Kainoa Chun. I liked how Justin freestyled, but I'm not going to do that. Um, Bryson is a Kamehameha Schools graduate, PT Dub, which is everybody here in this panel besides Taylor and Yaneta. And I'm the only public school person, so congratulations me. It's a very common theme in my life, a lot of uh, KS grads uh, in and around the circle of Hawaiian filmmakers. Imo. Um, Bryson Kainoa Chun was born and raised on the windward side of Oahu in 2016. He was a Sundance Film Festival Native Shorts Lab Fellow, where he workshopped his film Kapiko, great film, which premiered at the Hawaii International Film Festival in 2017 and went on to be selected in the 2018 PBS Online Film Festival. Later that year, he was chosen to be part of the inaugural Imaginative Film Festival Feature Writing Fellowship, where he wrote Where Is My Mind, a Hawaii-based horror film. Cool. He was the 2019 Ohina Lab Screenlight Award winner, where he produced his surreal comedy short, Other People, another great film, under the mentorship of Thor Ragnarok writer Eric Pearson. That same year, he was also selected for a feature writing fellowship with the LA Skins Fest, where he wrote the native rom-com um, Unmatched. God, this guy does not stop writing. His pilot script, Poi Dogs, was selected by the Blacklist as a part of their inaugural Indigenous list, which spotlights some of the best Indigenous film and television writing writers living and working in the US. He is currently pursuing his MFA in screenwriting. I don't know why, because he's a crazy screenwriter already. From the Institute of American Indian Arts. Not enough writing credits for this man. Um, i am only become to know uh, Bryson uh, fairly recently, but I'm a fan of his works. Um, especially one of my favorite things about Bryson is that he's um, in the projects that I've seen him produce, as well as the um, synopsis that I've seen kind of come from his projects. They're very diverse and I'm very um, excited to see all the types of styles of works that he's able to create. So aloha and welcome, Brexit. Mahalo for that <laughs> introduction. It's, it's like so obnoxious actually to hear that back and um, to hear it from Aina who I look up to as a filmmaker and I respect a lot. I mean, all of you in this space that we're sharing virtually but um, that really means a lot. So I'm stoked to be here. And um, I'm especially stoked to introduce um, Aaron Lau, who, as Aina mentioned, fellow Kamehameha warrior. So I'm stoked about that. She's my little sister. Um, <laughs> you can thumbs down all you want. Um, Aaron uh, is a filmmaker from Kahalu'u, born and raised. Um, she went to UH Manoa's Academy for Creative Media, which will be a common theme, I think, for many of us, and started her career, like the other gentlemen, working for OEV TV. Um, she moved to Los Angeles after receiving a full-ride scholarship to Chapman University, amazing film school. And um, while she was there, she was selected as a 2017 Sundance Native Lab Fellow for her film, The Moon and the Night which is an outstanding film. And um, she's been getting a lot of recognition for it, rightfully. Um, and that went on to screen all over the world, placed in several competitions, including the 2018 Student BAFTA Awards. Since she graduated, uh, she signed with UTA, United Talent Agency, and continued her growth through programs, including Potter Keg's Break the Room, Sundance's Indigenous Intensive, presented by Warner Media, and Unlock Her Potential. Uh, she's now the senior uh, senior producer director for Jubilee Media, which if you haven't seen their videos on YouTube, you've been living under a rock. They make amazing viral content. It's really crazy what they've done. And honestly, they were a good company. But since Aaron has joined them, their viewership has increased like tenfold. So definitely check it out. Um, but Jubilee, she does amazing things there. Um, and they develop empathy forward videos for brands, including Google, Netflix, and always. So please join me in welcoming Aaron Lau. I gotta put you on a call with my boss and have you repeat that. <laughs> but no, I think what's amazing just from what everyone has shared is how many connections there have been. Like I, 
I should have honestly included in my bio that part of what started my journey was actually meeting Taisanga and Aina when I was a Kamehameha school student in my junior year and their films screening at our school. And that kind of sparked part of my journey. And also bo bothering both Aina and Justin at OEB TV is like, is this a good edit? Am I doing a good job? How do I change the co color temperature on the camera? And there has been a lot of generosity among this group and just helping each other grow and also find our way in this journey. So it's, I think I just want to point to that of how remarkable that is in these last couple of decades that we've crossed paths. Yeah. I, think, I think that is such a beautiful thing about at least our filmmaking community here in Hawaii is that it does feel like a community and like a, like a, a tight knit relationships, you know, like um, for the most part, it feels like any one of us on any one of our projects can kind of reach out to anybody and ask for resources or ask for help or um, guidance in any kind of capacity. So I think, you know, that's one of the fortunate things that we have as being um, a Hawaii driven and a native Hawaiian driven filmmaking community. Absolutely. At some point, I w it may come up in this conversation that close to everyone in this chat or in this panel has probably seen me cry over something at some <laughs> on some film or some dilemma in this couple, uh, I think for me, 12 year journey. So that just goes to show how much I think comfort and and I guess cl how close we are to each other and that there is a space for vulnerability. Um, I Going off of that though, I think going on the path of being a filmmaker, particularly in a space that can be competitive and exhausting when you're considering the narratives that have existed around our home and community. Like, I think it's inspiring and also interesting to discuss like how, why on earth did we go on these journeys and what brought us to this place? place um now yeah, i would love to hear your guys stories and what brought you here i'll go since i'm like the resident old man here and like back in the day back in my day um but no it was um it was college i feel like uh similarly maybe for a lot of folks that there was a big unlocking um both on my hawaiian identity and discovering this tool of filmmaking to express that. And I um, was really fortunate to kind of get both at the same time where I had to unlearn a lot of the colonial uh, histories in which I was taught or we were all brought up in on a um, you know school basis or elementary all the way through high school. And then starting to realize that things aren't necessarily that exact way and there's a lot of uh, shifts in how we should be thinking maybe more critically and um, how um, just the things that have been hidden from us, I guess. And so at the same time, just like learning a lot about filmmaking, uh, I was introduced to Punihei, who was Naalehu's sister, who introduced me to Naalehu and then OEV TV, which was already grounded in its own um, station for the nation kind of identity and wanting to uh, build that uh, platform to educate folks on our community and how we see each other and so it's just a perfect storm of when uh, those two things were happening for myself and figuring out myself and then allowed to express myself and be vulnerable um, with this art form and yeah it was like um i think something i point to also is that it was like a, a kuleana a thing that like uh, chose me not necessarily that i chose it it just like fell in and felt good uh, where previously I was feeling lost. And so I was thankful for for that moment and the people that helped me figure it out, I guess. And I do need to plug, because we both went to UH for film school, that Aina has made one of the most famous and one of my top three favorite films to come out of that school, Moke Action, which is, I think you can watch it online, if correct me if I'm wrong, but that's the reason my boyfriend knew he went to the right film school was when he saw Milk Action in high school. <laughs> and so I now go watch that film. Yeah. And then when we first met you at KS, we were showing um, 
Ty was showing stones and I was showing like the first thing that I ever made, which was really like weird to see it like play at other places, you know, I think like HIF and then FKS. And, um, and yeah, I, of that whole audience full of people, like there was one Aaron Lowe and, you know, and then look at her now. And so like, you know, those are the kinds of, I think, things that we're projecting out there for more of our, um, our, our people to be able to open up that this is something that we all can do. Absolutely. And I, I'll go next and kind of speaking on this journey because, I mean, you and Ty had such a huge influence. I, I started making films initially, and if I'm being honest, a little selfishly. I, my father runs a Native Hawaiian nonprofit, and I couldn't focus on perpetuating Hawaiian slacky and or kihoalu, and I couldn't play an instrument to save my life, so they just made me film the concerts. Um, and that's fair. <laughs> so I had a, I was looking for my form to express myself and to process a lot of difficult feelings and questions I was going through in my youth. And I found that film was the tool to that. And it was only when I actually saw Ty and Ina's work when I was in high school that I realized, oh, I can do this. Like I can, our work can serve so much more and our work can actually be of our community and our place and our identity as well and so that kind of inspired me to think about the power of it at a whole another level and that has been the fire that's pushed me forward for the last 12 years and especially as now you know whether it's with Jubilee or Sundance I've really come to recognize the sheer power of filmmaking, television, just really any visual medium in that this has the ability to shift the way we get to move in the world. Like these mediums affect policy and empathy and racism and if how we are looked at and therefore how we get to move. And I think that I, I just, that's amazing. And I just want to do whatever it takes to make it better for everyone. And so filmmaking is simply the tool in which I hope to do that. But no, thank you for helping to give me that inspiration, Aina. I, I hate to jump in after that because that was amazing, but it, it sounds disingenuous, but genu genuinely Aina and Ty, and maybe, you know, maybe uh, it's not uh, uh, an anomaly, but they inspired, like, I actually think a, a generation of young Native filmmakers to do what we're all doing today. Um, I didn't really think about film as a as something I could ever do until I went to college. And the film for me, Moke Action was amazing, but what it was was Live Tonight, which I that's like a deep cut film. I don't even think people talk nice. about it enough. But <laughs> Ina made a film. Wow, wow. Was, yeah, it, that's it the same amazing. film that Aaron saw. Yeah. Oh, there you go. I mean, it's an amazing film. And what was cool about it was there was just Olelo Hawaii in it or Hawaiian language, just casually being spoken. And at that time, as like a not a great speaker myself, to just have it being normalized in film and think, OK, this is just a film that stands among all the other films that are in this program or above them. I'm just beyond. I'll be keep it real. Um, and it was just a great film to see when I was starting out, I think. I know was kind of about to graduate and I just started film school and seeing that right out the gate was like, okay, now I have a focus. Like I have a, a journey and I know if I'm following in this guy's footsteps or at least in the same direction, you know, we all take different paths to get there. But, you know, I know was some, someone that I think a lot of us looked up to from that generation. And I act like you're old, but you're not an old man. You're just, you know, <laughs> you were just there and you paved the way for a lot of us along with Ty um, and, you know, that film Stones getting into Sundance, it like, you know, you, you hear about Sundance as like this mythical thing that you just think, okay, it's unattainable. None of us will ever get there. It's just something like, you know, famous people go to. And for Ty to get in and then kind of open the door for all of us to be native lab filmmakers, you know, that was just such a huge deal because for someone like me, I'm like, I don't know what, the journey will be but being able to be a native lab person and know like okay people like Tai Sanga did this Aina did this 
you know, it just tells me it, it validates you and says, you know, I'm doing something right to be in their company, at least in a bio like that we just read. So, um, you know, I, I, I continue to be inspired by these guys work and, um, uh, you know, Hawaiian soul, amazing, but I, I, like for me, especially down on the sidewalk, which was just such a honestly groundbreaking short. Um, and I, I don't want to like cut off Justin who wants to talk about his journey, but I am curious <laughs> about how you guys tell those kinds of stories too, but we'll circle back. But that's really my journey was following you guys. Nice. Um, I, I've shared this story a, a number of times, I guess, but for me, it kind of started with a, a project in my English class in seventh grade. Um, our teacher gave us all a, a year long assignment to write a, a story, a novel, like a, a little book, I guess a short book. Um, and at the time, this new TV show, a local TV show called The Brothers and Friends had just come out on our, um, you know, our, our television stations here in Hawaii. And it was one of the first times that I had seen local comedy and, and kind of our own comedy on TV and in this way. And, you know, I was inspired by it. I was like, oh, I want to do that. That's super cool. That's, that's funny. That's awesome. And so, you know, I asked my English teacher, instead of writing a book, can I partner up with my friend in the class and can we write a script? And we'll shoot the movie instead, you know. Um, and I'd never written a script before. I never shot anything before. But she said, okay, yeah, go for it. And so we wrote a script. Uh, ended up using my mom's VHS camera and, you know, family as all the characters and actors. And, uh, yeah, it came out with this, like, bought, bought us, like, a cheap editing software that I put on our family PC and figured out how to, like, cut stuff together and came out with this 45 minute long movie with titles and everything. And, and it was epic. And I was like, Oh, this is super freaking cool. And, and then like two days before the thing was due, like the computer completely crashed and all the files corrupted and I lost everything that I worked on. And, and basically, and yeah, and laid face down on the floor that, that night crying my eyes out. And, uh, and on the day that we had to present and show and share with everybody, all I could show was the raw footage, you know, and, and I was just so dismayed because I was like, I had a movie just like two nights ago um, and all people get to see is the raw thing. And so for whatever reason, that experience like really stuck with me and kind of, I told myself then, okay, I'm going to take all the classes that I can take. I'm going to learn what I can learn. And um, cause I want to keep doing this, but I don't want to make the same mistake. And so for myself and my journey, I, you know, went to high school and, and KS, Imuo, we had a great video production program. Um, and also at the same time, like Aina mentioned how he was learning in college, I, um, you know, I, I was becoming exposed in middle school and high school to Hawaiian culture and history and language. Um, because in, in my own family, I didn't grow up with that so much. You know, my parents and my grandparents don't speak Hawaiian. Um, cultural practices weren't really known a practice and so to start to learn the history and, and the language in school really opened up my eyes and kind of solidified my identity and then finding this passion of filmmaking um, was something that I guess catalyzed this journey for me and and seeing that man I can combine these two passions and like I I, I want to see more stuff that highlight our stories that are unique and have just as much value as any Greek story that you're going to see or read or, or watch a movie. Um, and so where are those? And so for me, it was always this, okay, one day I want to make movies that tell our stories, that tell stories of this place on a level that stands up to any other Hollywood film that is right there alongside anything. And so, yeah, when I applied to colleges, I, I only applied to film schools and was grateful that I got into USC and spent four years there in LA, um, continuing to build my peer group and, and other like-minded filmmakers from around the world. And, um, you know, I, simultaneously, I guess for me at that time, while I was going to school in California, I was coming home for the summers and the winter breaks. And um, it was there that I had met Na'alehu, who was one of the founders of OEV TV and kind of built a relationship with him. And, and so every time I would come home, I'd ask, you know, if, if there's any shoots or, or productions that they're working on that I could just jump on and help out, um, I'm all for it. And so 
through my college years kind of built a relationship with them. That's how I initially met Aina. It was a, you know, week long project. We were shooting out at a beach house in Mokulei on the North shore and um, realized that we had a lot of the same interests and passions in, in what we wanted to do um, in terms of filmmaking. And so, yeah, when I was getting ready to graduate from SC, I really didn't feel like staying in LA and continuing to do that. For me, the goal was always to leave with the hope of coming back and making movies here. And so I was fortunate when Na'alehu and um, those guys reached out and said, you know, if you're planning to stay in LA, that's fine, do your thing. If you wanna come home, we've got a spot for you. And so I graduated and moved back home and started with my journey uh, with OEV TV. And it was really, I know that kind of like showed me how to, you know, edit and all of that for the first time, how to shoot. I think the first project that came on, like the next day after I came back from LA, um, we were at a Hawaiian language immersion school um, retreat on the big island. And uh, we had to shoot, you know, a couple of news stories every day and had to turn it literally the next day. And I had no idea what I was doing. So I remember Aina had to literally take the project from me and cut it. You know, and but from then it was like an amazing, immersive learning experience, and um, yeah, the journey continues. First day back was like Mauna Kea, right? That was like we went up Mauna Kea and all the way to Waiau, and like um, that kind of just I don't know. I think it was kind of symbolic of like our journey, um, and then even yeah, the the ten day shoot. We're all like living together in the North Shore and got to know each other, and also like super hyped on i just graduated i remember my first job was that job I was just like super hyped like we're gonna make all this stuff and i want to do this and like all of these cool like movies that still like are in the, the mind book uh, that we will make one day but like i don't know it was really sweet and genuine to have like somebody to really vibe off of and want to make the same kinds of things you know and that's everybody in a nutshell and these kind of like in our um, growing who we is like um, but what I'm really excited about is that we're starting to like expand the landscape a little bit each of our individual perspectives um, paints a more full picture for your non-Hawaiian audience of like the different Hawaiian experiences um, yeah and so I think it's pretty pretty cool I, I don't know I'm just interested I think we've talked about this like um, previously you know not recorded but like um all of us come from like some place of privilege in order to make these to this for this to be our journey you know not everyone gets a chance to make films because in reality it's hard uh, expensive to live in hawaii and also hard to make money off of this art form here at the moment um yeah i don't know what are your guys like thoughts about that and like I don't know if if we do have this privilege. What is our kuleana? I guess. I can Although, go. yeah, go ahead. <laughs> no, I I can go first, and I guess this this so this becomes a conversation of what is what makes a valuable story, or like what is a meaningful film. And we have been, you know, kind of going back a little bit to the notes of a lot of us noticed a lack of our stories and the things we were taught, especially all of us having gone to film school, we were, we were taught Western filmmaking. That was primarily what was presented to us, French New Wave and the American Westerns and such like that. And I think for a long time, it took me a little bit of like trying to figure out like what what is our filmmaking and what is needed for us to bring uh, what is important to us to the screen. And I want to also in that kind of be conscious of it also doesn't require great monetary value that I think there have been incredibly meaningful films that are deeply vulnerable and truly revealing of the person behind the camera and who they represent that is done for very simple, in a very simple way not an expensive way because I think there is this idea of the gatekeepers control the industry and what gets to be made because it requires lots and lots of money and there is some truth to that depending you know if you want to make the Polynesian Star Wars it gets a little tricky without money but 
I think the first just starting out that isn't necessarily required. Like everybody here has made great work without needing to worry about rich people to back you or worrying about having uh, maybe a wealthy Caucasian friend that will like let you borrow their stuff. Like that isn't, I think I want to unpack that a little bit and say you don't need these things to make meaningful work. And if you can make that work first, it may open doors to, you know, if you do want to do the Star Hawaiian Star Wars or if you want to make a feature that maybe has, you know, we get to 30 day shoot days. And so I, I first want to acknowledge that like for anyone who watches this and thinks I need all of this stuff, I need a red camera, I need this and that to make, to get to even like start this journey that no, like I made mine with a DV camera and my nieces and nephews was my first film. Um, so I, I apologize if I took that down a random tangent, but at first I want to kind of just acknowledge that. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, I don't know what comes to mind when you, when you start to open up that and talk about that. I think it's, it's that idea that like the best way to learn how to make films is by doing it. You know, um, like we, like you said, we've all gone to film school and I can speak for myself. Like I, you know, I've learned a lot in film school. I learned kind of how to watch movies, how to talk about movies and, and those kinds of things, but how to actually make movies. Really a lot of that knowledge came afterwards, like working at OEB TV. And then after that, you know, working on our narrative short films and um, making the mistakes and all of that. And so I think, you know, to your point, to start off, it really does take an idea and a good idea and um, and kind of the, the commitment to kind of see it through and, and f pull together the resources because whether it's money or not, it's, I mean, it does take resources, you know, and a lot of times resources can come in the form of community, you know, and I think maybe here in Hawaii, that's one of our strong points is is our connection to community, is our ability to rely on family or is our ability to rely on friends um, to come together. Like I know like with Down on the Sidewalk, like, and it, it's something that we talk about a lot. Like we were fortunate to get a little bit of funding to make these films, but by and large they're done because other talented filmmakers, cinematographers, um, actors, what have you, are willing to give the time and give their path and give their talent for you know less than what they should be getting paid or what they're less than what they're worth and so I, I think it does take a lot of that but I also think to to what you're saying like that that's there should there isn't really a barrier to start to make them to grow from it but I think I think where each of us maybe is finding ourselves now is that we have made several shorts. We have made, you know, we have put that experience in. And so how do we leverage um, the experiences that we do, that we have gained and the, the content that we have created to level up, to bring in bigger resources, to do bigger scale projects? You know, I think, I don't know, maybe just speaking for myself personally, but I, I feel like I can also speak for the collective. That's where each of us maybe want to go, you know, in, in our journeys. I think, yeah, just to piggyback off of that point, I think, yeah, one of the great points that, you know, Justin brings up is that we do have a really great community here. And even though all of us do very different work, um, I think the biggest part is that we're either helping each other. And, and if we're not, we're not competing with each other either. There's a, a sense of community in that we're not trying to battle over resources or put each other down. Um, and I think the ability to bring in talented people to work not at scale or whatever it is, it comes from, you know, we're working with professionals who have to go day to day working at Hawaii Five O or Magnum PI, and they're hungry to tell stories that are about this place. And, um, you know, so the, to Aina's question about Kuleana, it's our Kuleana to tell those stories or to kind of mine our own experiences to say, this is something that is unique to this place. And we're trying to tell uniquely Hawaii stories. And um, so I guess I, I want to flip that and then like ask a question of you guys is, 
you know, we're all going off of these different journeys, like how Justin is saying, and, you know, we've all done multiple shorts. And I think we all are on a very similar journey, even though we're making very different films. But there is a trajectory of, I notice, in, you know, indigenous filmmakers, whether it's us or, you know, in New Zealand or Native American filmmakers, we kind of take a path of having to work through certain traumas that <laughs> Hawaiians have faced. And, um, and I see the journey in our films of we, we make the thing that kind of grapples with it, our own experience with trauma as an indigenous person. And then if you look at like how our work progresses, it becomes increasingly uplifting. And I think we're moving in that direction. And I'm curious what your guys' thoughts are about that. You know, how important it is, if you think so, to get to that point and then just to level up and like, you know, where we made a lot of shorts and shorts are really great, but how do we reach larger audiences with those stories? And, um, you know, what do you guys think about about that journey and, you know, where you're at in that process? Anybody want to jump at it? <laughs> Otherwise I'll go. Um, it's funny because I've taken a little bit of, I think you can look at all of my work and a, a friend once uh, made a joke that I think is very accurate to my body of work, which is, is, is your goal to just bum people out? <laughs> And I think that's a fair comment. And it's something, to be honest, like I haven't actually, I have been very focused on my Jubilee work the last couple of years, and I haven't actually made a scripted film since 2018. So it's been about three years now. And that was a little, although during that time, I wasn't conscious of it. There was a, a subconscious intent, like, wall at work and then after I made the moon and the night I had to kind of go through a period of time where I reflected on what do I want to put out into the world and I never want to tell anybody how they should process trauma I think that to try to micromanage that or minute tell someone this is how you have to do it is very could be very harmful and it's weird when we're we're trying to be responsible but also deal with trauma, but also make work about that trauma. And that's a very murky place to kind of walk through. And, you know, I've made a lot of work that's explored very difficult, confusing either experiences or relationships in my life or identity related. And now that I've done that, I kind of had to take a step back and ask myself, now what? Like now, how do I walk this path and ensure that what I'm putting out is actually, I can honestly say, I believe is we pushing us forward and not adding to the harm because we have had so many narratives by the outside that has harmed us. And I don't, even if we are Kanaka, even if we're of this community, that doesn't mean we also can't harm our own community. And so I've kind of had to take my own step back and process and sort of for lack of a better word, mature in some ways and just like reflect because who I am and what I think is going to bleed into the work no matter what. So at least speaking for myself individually, that's where I am in this journey. And it's only recently that I've come to a place of like, okay, I know how I want to maybe walk now. I feel ready for that. And a lot of that had to do with reconnecting. I think having, going to the Mauna for the first time in a few years was with OEV TV in 2015 it was life-changing then to go back in 2019 and reconnect and to kind of deepen myself after being lost in some ways was a big part in remembering okay I can do this I think I know how to walk forward now um yeah I don't know I when, when I think about that question that you asked Bryson um I feel like I've noticed, especially within our indigenous communities, whether that's the Hawaiian community, the, Ma the Maori community, Native Americans, like our filmmaking and our storytelling, in a lot of ways, it's the, the stories we decide to tell and the chronology of it seems to be like, um, I mean, everything is cause and effect and, and response, call and response in a way, right? And so if just in the last several decades, we've as, as a people, 
um, been able to gain this, the tools and the knowledge to be able to tell our own stories. Um, where for so long, if you look at a lot of Hollywood movies that are set in Hawaii or um, kind of are focused in and around yeah, Hawaii themes, um, they don't represent by and large our lived experiences here. You know, they feel disingenuous, they feel inauthentic. And a lot of times feel like uh, this kind of like fantasy paradise when, you know, for so many of us, our lived experiences is not that, you know, yes, this place is beautiful. Yes, this place is magical and, and all of that. But there's, there's also that, um, the real side to it. And I feel like for all of us that are pushing the boundaries of filmmaking, whether that was, you know, our documentary for founders in this um, movement, or, or kind of us kind of pushing the boundaries of narrative filmmaking, it always seems like the first step is to address that, you know, it's like, okay, the first films we make do address this trauma. And the first films that we make um, tend to show a picture that is, that goes against what Hollywood has painted for so long of this place, right? And so you have feature films like Chris's Waikiki, right? That is very much... Um, yeah, looks at looks at how hard it is to to struggle to to live and to struggle as as a native Hawaiian in Hawaii, whether that's working multiple jobs to make ends meet or dealing with mental illness or any any of the number of things that kind of are systematic causes of of uh, colonization and a history of colonization in our islands, and um, and even if you know if you look at the Maoris, you have a lot of um, Meratamitas films, or you have Once Were Warriors, which are all very like sort of dealing like films that really deal with the trauma before. And I feel like a lot of those have to get put out first in order for us to like speak to what has already come from Hollywood, but also for ourselves to process that thing. Um, and then I feel like hopefully we'll, we'll get to a point where like I feel the, the Maoris by and large have reached in a way where it's like yeah, okay, we've talked about all the serious stuff. You know, we've we've um, addressed those kinds of things. And it's not to say that that's going to stop, but can we laugh at ourselves now? You know, part of it is like, as a community, as a Hawaiian community, I feel like we take ourselves so seriously that like to to make fun of our own culture is like blasphemy, you know? And it's not to do it in a disdain kind of way, but like if you want to talk about satire or irony, like satire to me and parody is one of the most intelligent ways that you can talk about any kind of issue, right? And so how do we, I think, I think it takes moving through making those traumatic films or addressing those kind of trauma-driven films um, to get to a point where we feel comfortable enough to just laugh at ourselves and tease ourselves. Because then, you know, how can you laugh at or tease anybody else or, you know, any of that, um, if you can first step for yourself. I know, I feel like, I was just going to say, I feel like, particularly in your work, you've been very conscious of c celebration and joy within our community. And I, I saw you unmuted yourself, so I'm pretty sure you're going to speak to that. But I just, I feel like you are particularly conscious of this. Um, yeah, I think totally exactly what Justin said that like Mocha Action was born out of all these films made in Hawaii that didn't actually, all the local characters never speak pigeon correctly. And so I was just like, well, I'm going to make a pigeon movie, you know, that are like a real pigeon movie, which still I feel like is the the pigeon movie to, to, to date. And my only viral hit is because everyone in Hawaii understands that right it's not just about um, native points but all of us speak pigeon and that's like ours and so that's why i feel like um learning that lesson of that's funny is short and it's like us something that we can all represent and so i think those are really if we're, we're building community in hawaii specifically you know not necessarily addressing what we want everyone else to know which is a part of kind of what we've been putting out and building um, as reaction to uh, Hollywood's view on us. But like, um, I don't know, building us up internally, becoming, you know, this being our circle that um, that is true to us uh, as people from Hawaii. And um, 
and yeah, I think, you know, uh, with Black Lives Matter and um, some critiques I've heard on that is that we can't just like watch black trauma, but there needs to be a space to um, understand black joy and like being able to um, sit with that as well, you know? And so, yeah, exactly what Justin said that uh, we needed to as a, as a, as a way to say that, nah, nah, this is not exactly um, everything that you've become to know about Hawaii, but this is, you know, for us that live here, this is what, how we see it. But yeah, I'm kind of like now after sitting through <laughs> years, a few years of all of our um, trauma driven films, which were necessary. I was like, yeah, I want to make funny stuff again. Um, because yeah, all of it, again, like what I was saying too earlier is that like, all of us now having our different like takes on um, our own experiences and what we want to add to um, the media landscape is like we should be making more stuff, different stuff, whatever, you know, like um, two gay characters dancing in the middle of Windward Mall, you know, like <laughs> that should be out there. And, um, you know, to point to Bryson's other people, which is um, was really risky. You know, I don't think that was like really what anyone was expecting. Um, uh, not just from a Hawaiian, but in, in general, and, but like it totally deserved to be made. And so um, I think that's really exciting. And like, uh, I don't know, I don't know where to go. I feel like we're getting really panelly. I feel like I wish we would you know, <laughs> be less panelly no. and just like, yeah, sh talk a little bit. I, I want to add to that in that I think I, it's, I, at least speaking for myself, as far as, what like I think we get caught in a mindset of that I have to make an absolutely excellent film that can somehow carry all of this for my community and that is almost paralyzing and I think it also makes it more daunting for new people to come into the space in our community to start making work because the only way we're really going to get to like in my opinion what we need to do is be making everything we need somebody who makes genre Hawaiian films we need someone who makes rom-coms and or makes everything and we also I would say drama and the exploration of trauma does need to exist but we also need celebration and joy in the work and I joke and I know a few of you heard me have heard me make this joke of like uh make make mediocre films acceptable <laughs> <laughs> like we hold ourselves to incredibly difficult standards and in that, almost that almost kind of has a, a negative effect and then we don't progress forward as quickly as we could, especially when with short films, it's a matter of just getting hits at the bat and learning and being willing to accept that maybe not every film you're gonna make is a banger and that's okay. And to allow yourself to explore new genre, new spaces of storytelling. Um, I also am kind of curious for you guys if and we talk a lot about what's in the film, but what do you bring to your sets? Like, what is the space that you kind of set with your crew? Are you doing protocol? Are you, you know, we land acknowledgements have become something even popular in Los Angeles. And I, I'm just kind of curious, like, what does it look like on set for you as you create these things and set, you know, intentionality? Can I just yeah point to Justin Achong because he's taught me a lot about that I think and that's like if we're looking at our Hawaiian identity, um, spirituality is a big foundation for uh, how we interpret the world and so that's something that's not really found I feel like on set previously but what by incorporating that it makes it a Hawaiian experience and so. Justin can speak to kind of like things that he's done. I think on set, really um, eye-opening and really push. I feel like both of us forward and how we want to carry ourselves on every set. Yeah, I think you know to to that point in that question. I think if if we're talking about what is what is Hawaiian films, right? What are Hawaiian films? I think it's it's not necessarily just about the content, right? Like you said, we need to be as as native Hawaiian filmmakers making. Uh, yeah, making everything, you know, from rom-coms to uh, dramas to whatever. And so for me, part of it, uh, or just as important as the content, is the process 
um, and and making sure that you know the story that we tell. Did we do our due diligence in talking to the people who are most connected to that particular thing in the community? Whether that's with Aina's Hawaiian soul and him having to literally talk to almost every one of the Helm Ohana um, before even getting to move forward with that that story and and filming that that film, or you know, for for myself with Don on the sidewalk. Um, you know, it, it's based on a person and his work who had passed away in the 80s. And so kind of taking the time to just connect and, and pull in and, and ask for them to their guidance to be brought in. And, um, you know, with that short film, a lot of it took place in it was centered in Waikiki. And so to understand that place plays an important role in telling the story as well. And so. You know, before we even went to film, me and Aina went into Waikiki a number of times and just spent time in the place, um, gave ho'okupu to the place, you know, brought our intentions, brought our pule. And what's amazing is like every every set experience that I've had since that, um, during filming, we're always shown like ho'ailona or kind of signs or symbols that point us in the right direction, whether that's supernatural nature kind of things or just the way everything aligns and lines up um being better than you could have planned for um yeah i think i think hawaiian is part of the process not just the content i i want to add to that because i there's something chris yogi had said when talking about august at akiko that i thought was very beautiful he he didn't necessarily have a traditional script for that. I think he had ideas for the scenes. He knew what he needed to hit. But making that film, he wanted to make the film in reaction to what the world gave him. Like to live in reaction to it and to be open to it. And I think I certainly am like not the most rooted Kanaka, but I do think there is that for me personally part of our mindset and what it is to make a Hawaiian film is to also react to what is the space giving you and to move in rhythm with it. And even though The Moon and the Night is a very scripted film, I know to some extent, like me and my team talked about, like if it rains, if it storms, if it's sunny, we're gonna just go with what it gives us. And we're gonna, the film is gonna be made in, fl in flow with it. And I, I also want to say to some extent too that the treatment of our crew and in the way in which we run productions needs to also reflect these values. Like I, I don't believe in do whatever it takes necessarily because I think that can be harmful. I think that you have to live in a very give and take relationship with your crew and cast. And that's also an extension of who we are and our values. Um, so I just kind of wanted to throw that two cents in and I think that's really great. And just jumping off of that, of not being the most grounded Kanaka, I, I relate to that. And I think, you know, we do look at these things like on a sliding scale to some degree where there's a point system in your mind, like, oh yeah, you know what? He speaks Olelo Hawaii. So that's like six points. And then, oh, you went to Kamehameha. That's a couple extra points. And then, you know, it's like you have these uh, varying degrees of indigeneity or I don't even know if that's the way I look at it but for me I think I, I relate to what Aaron is is talking about because um, for me doing a protocol or something like that is it's a little disingenuous in the sense that I'd be doing it in a performative way and I think that's not beneficial to what what our process needs to be as, as a, a community. And, you know, we've, we've all been on panels just like this for the past 10 years or however long. And we're always asked, okay, what does it mean to make a, a Hawaiian film? And everyone has an answer. And my answer has changed as many times as it's been asked. And I think, you know, it, it's to that point where I, I look at all of your films and I can't pinpoint necessarily why they are Hawaiian films, but they are. And I think, um, you know, it, it's like when we look at a Picasso or something, we don't look at it and say, oh, yeah, that's a Spanish painting, right? I mean, it's a Picasso. And when I look at Ina's work and Aaron's work and Justin's work, I think the same thing of, of you guys, where 
you're making things that are distinctly you. And because you're doing that, and because I'm trying to do that for myself, I can't not make a Hawaiian film. Like it's impossible. I could make anything and I, I can't escape it. Not that I would want to, but I think that's just something that we try to do. And I think, um, you know, whether it's doing protocol or doing a pule and things like that, or it's just the way, like Aaron says, we there's an intentionality behind what we do. Of we want to represent this place in as best a way as we can, and it's not always positive, but we try to do it in the truest way possible to our own experiences. And I think that's important. And I think um, you know it's equally important to do what Aaron is saying, which is allow for not every movie to be a banger. Like we have to get out there and I think you know it takes it takes many years to make a good film I'm still trying to make one and I think if for someone who's you know made a career on mediocre films that like that's where <laughs> I'm stoked to hear Aaron's opinion on that and um, I think you know just to share this panel with you off of the basis of the work I've made which has always been to me very weird or a little outside of the box of what um, a lot of us are making I think it's exciting to say that, you know what? Yeah, I am a part of this Hawaiian film community without there being a Lolo Hawaii in every film I make or without every character being, you know, Kanaka Maoli or whatever. And, you know, we do all these different things and we reach into genre and the more we can get into every room in the world, the better it is for us. You know, we get somebody writing on a, a TV show and then somebody making a movie somebody making a, a Marvel movie, you know, and we get into all these spaces and it's, it's all we can really do to get out there. And we, we deserve a spot in all these spaces. And the more we can occupy them, the better off we make it for everyone. So. That's like the mic drop moment. <laughs> but no, I, to that point, it's like, you, we need to be very conscious of not treating Hawaiian filmmaking as a checklist. It's not, did you, is land a character? Did you mention like two Olelo Hawaii words? Did this happen? It's not, I think the more, I do think the more honest you in place you work from your na'al, the, and the more that you stand in who you are, then that's all it is, personally speaking, of course. But I, I think, oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. No, go. No, I was just going to piggyback and add on that is that, and, and to what Bryson said, I think, you know, all of these films, like, how, yeah, how do you pinpoint what is a Hawaiian film or, you know, um, and I, I think at the, at the end of the day, it is because we are and we made it, you know, and um, whatever our lived experience is, as you know, and it runs the spectrum from the most rooted, you know, most Olala Hawaii speaking didn't grow up in Hawaii that is like just coming to learn their, their culture like is it not all um yeah I mean I guess just to, to be able to carry that experience and express it through your work makes it what it is yeah <laughs> and with that with a little bit of time we have left and you know carrying all of this these thoughts I am curious what is everybody working on and how are we trying to embody all of this in our next work i'll go first i'm just i'm i'm really trying to take the lessons of the last couple years and ask myself how do i make how do i talk about things that are deeply important to me in a more responsible way an accessible way and so i'm moving into genre i am trying to attempting to write my first feature as a horror and we will see what happens with that. But a lot of that is motivated by the things I've mentioned on this panel of how do I talk about these things in a way that yes, is kind of entertaining, but ultimately is careful and allows people to process without hitting too close to home. And then also continue to do my work at Jubilee. Who else is making things? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
yeah, for myself, Hawaiian Soul has just begun kind of its festival run. And so this year being less traditional than others on how we approach um, getting our film seen, I really want to kind of key in on our community still. Um, like many of us, like Hawaii is kind of our, our main audience for this film. And so um, let the virtual festivals hopefully give insight to uh, more folks abroad um, but how do we yeah, get it into the classrooms, especially with the message that we have that we're trying to um, teach and share um, about this uh, beloved man that is being forgotten and so and also showcase our works. And then to me, to be honest, I think a part of that, too, is still to how to capitalize, like literally how to make a like some money and income off of filmmaking, you know, as much as you know, it's not necessarily in our worldview on um, money. It's something that I feel like is a part of our art form, our business. And um, and so where are the, the spaces where we can continue to grow income so that we can make more of our works um, and, and take care of our families. And so that's something that I've been thinking about and hopefully wanting to um, pursue in 2021. Justin, do you want to go next? Um, I guess for myself, kind of juggling a handful of different projects, but a lot of them at the moment, more short form. Um, I, I've been, I'm, I'm kind of stoked on the opportunity that I've been given to work with um, Mia Taro on a project um, who created the Fourth World Media Lab that I got to be a part of this past year, um, connecting kind of indigenous filmmakers from around the world. And so... Um, we're currently working on a project. I think it's um, it's a project with, I think, six or seven other indigenous filmmakers from around the world where we're looking at the idea or the theme of reciprocity and what, what that means within your own community. Um, this idea that, by and large, indigenous communities live by a worldview that sees everything as give and take sees everything as like a, a relationship, right? Whether that's person to person or within families or um, between man and Aina or land. Um, and so, yeah, getting to each explore in a short form content, um, what that means in our own communities uh, and then kind of combining that into, into some kind of piece. Um, so kind of excited about that. And then also just in the early development and pre-production stages for another narrative short film um, called The Man in the Tree, which um, just like Down on the Sidewalk and Hawaiian Soul has received some funding from Pacific Islanders and Communications who shout out to them, you know, for the last couple of years have been um, awesome in funding a lot of um, short films within our community and has given us the opportunity to put a little bit of budget behind our works um, and, and start to elevate our work in that way. And so, um, yeah, it's another short that I'm developing called The Man in the Tree. So then it's around um, a family as they prepare for their, their elders passing uh, in a ceremonial way. Um, mine will sound so selfish compared to everyone's, but I'll try to circle back and make it beautiful. But, um, <laughs> Getting a, a, a pilot script on um, on the blacklist this past year was like the biggest thing that has happened for me ever personally, because, you know, people don't really look at our writing and look for our projects. And for the first time, um, people are looking at it and, and reading it. And so I will say my my short term goal is to develop that or, you know, just find my way into a, a writer's room somewhere like that is my goal with the long-term goal being to bring a writer's room home to Hawaii. And all you guys got jobs when I make that happen. But that is just uh, the long-term goal is we need to be making television shows that take place here, but writing it here and directing it here. And um, that's, that's my long-term goal. So I'm speaking it into existence for all of Sundance to, to hear and call me up if you can make it happen. But there you go manifest no i it's been a pleasure speaking with all of you guys and i look forward to watching this five ten years down the road 
and seeing where we are and getting to reflect on the journey we've walked. And also watching this and shaking my head at every awkward moment I had on this panel. But it's been a pleasure getting to this point with you guys over the last decade, several years. Um, and to I look forward to what the next decade looks like together. <laughs>